Imperialism and World Economy by Nikolai Bukharin. This is the introduction written by Vladimir Lenin and the preface. Introduction. The importance and timeliness of the topic treated in the work of Nikolai Bukharin require no particular elucidation. The problem of imperialism is not only a most essential one, but we must say it is the most essential problem in that realm of economic science which examines the changing forms of capitalism in recent times. Everyone interested not only in economics but in any sphere of present-day social life must acquaint himself with the facts relating to this problem, as presented by the author in such detail on the basis of the latest available data. Needless to say that there can be no concrete historical analysis of the present war if that analysis does not have for its basis a full understanding of the nature of imperialism, both from its economic and political aspects. Without this, it is impossible to approach an understanding of the economic and diplomatic situation of the last decades. And without such an understanding, it is ridiculous even to speak of forming a correct view on the war. From the point of view of Marxism, which most clearly expresses the requirements of modern science in general, one can only smile at the scientific value of a method which consists in culling from diplomatic documents or from daily political events only such isolated facts as would be pleasant and convenient for the ruling classes of one country and parading this as a historic analysis of the war. Such is the case, for instance, with Plekhanov, who parted ways with Marxism altogether when, instead of analyzing the fundamental characteristics and tendencies of imperialism as a system of the economic relations of modern, highly developed, mature, and overripe capitalism, he started angling after bits of facts to please the, please the Pereshkoviches and the Mulyakovs. Under such conditions, the scientific concept of imperialism is reduced to the level of a cuss word addressed to the immediate competitors, rivals, and opponents of the two above-mentioned Russian imperialists, whose class basis is entirely identical with that of their foreign rivals and opponents. In these times of forsaken words, renounced principles, overthrown world conceptions, abandoned resolutions, and solemn promises, one must not be surprised at that. The scientific significance of Nikolai Bukharin's work consists particularly in this, that he examines the fundamental facts of world economy relating to imperialism as a whole, as a definite stage in the growth of most highly developed capitalism. There had been an epoch of a comparatively peaceful capitalism, when it had overcome feudalism in the advanced countries of Europe, and was in a position to develop comparatively tranquilly and harmoniously, peacefully spreading over tremendous, tremendous areas of still unoccupied lands and of countries not yet finally drawn into the capitalist vortex. Of course, even in that epoch, marked approximately by the years 1871 and 1914, peaceful capitalism created conditions of life that were very far from being really peaceful, both in the military and in a general class sense. For nine-tenths of the population of the advanced countries, for hundreds of millions of peoples in the colonies and in the backward countries, this epoch was not one of peace, but of oppression, tortures, horrors that seemed the most terrifying since they appear to be without end. This epoch has gone forever. It has been followed by a new epoch, comparatively more impetuous, full of abrupt changes, catastrophes, conflicts, an epoch that no longer appears to the toiling masses as horror without end, but is an end full of horrors. It is highly important to have in mind that this change was caused by nothing but the direct development, growth, continuation of the deep-seated and fundamental tendencies of capitalism and production of commodities in general. The growth of commodity exchange, the growth of large-scale production are fundamental tendencies observable for centuries throughout the whole world. At a certain stage in the development of exchange, at a certain stage in the growth of large-scale production, namely at that stage that was reached approximately at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries, commodity exchange had created such 
such internationalism of economic relations and such an internationalization of capital, accompanied by such a vast increase in large-scale production that free competition began to be replaced by monopoly. The prevailing types were no longer enterprises freely competing inside the country and through intercourse between countries, but non monopoly alliances of entrepreneurs, trusts. The typical ruler of the world became finance capital, a power that is peculiarly mobile and flexible, peculiarly intertwined at home and internationally, peculiarly devoid of individuality and divorced from the immediate processes of production, peculiarly easy to concentrate, a power that has already made peculiarly large strides on the road of concentration, so that literally several hundred billionaires and millionaires hold in their hands the fate of the whole world. Reasoning theoretically and in the abstract, one may arrive at the conclusion reached by Kotsky, who like many others has parted ways with Marxism, but in a different manner, that the time is not far off when those magnates of capital will unite into one world trust, which would replace the rivalries and the struggle of nationally limited finance capital by an internationally united finance capital. Such a conclusion, however, is just as abstract, simplified and incorrect as an analogous conclusion arrived at by our struvists and economists of the 90s of the last century. The latter, proceeding from the progressive nature of capitalism, from its inevitability, from its final victory in Russia, at times became apologetic, worshipping capital, making peace agreements with it, praising it instead of fighting it, at times became non-political, i.e. rejected politics or the importance of politics, denied the probability of general political convulsions, etc., this being the favorite error of the economists, at times even preached strike pure and simple. General strike to them was the apotheosis of the strike movement. It was elevated to position where other forms of the movement are forgotten or ignored. It was assalto mortal from capitalism to its destruction by strikes alone. There are indications that the undisputed progressiveness of capitalism compared with the semi-Philistine paradise of free competition and the inevitability of imperialism with its final victory over peaceful capital in the advanced countries of the world may at present lead to political and non-political errors and misadventures no less numerous or varied. Particularly as regards Kotsky, his open break with Marxism has led him not to reject or forget politics, nor to skim over the numerous and varied political conflicts, convulsions, and transformations that particularly characterize the imperialist epoch, nor to become an apologist of imperialism, but to dream about a peaceful capitalism. Peaceful capitalism has been replaced by unpeaceful, militant, catastrophic imperialism. This Kotsky is compelled to admit, for he admitted it as early as 1909 in a special work in which he drew sound conclusions as a Marxist for the last time. If it is thus impossible simply, directly, and bluntly to dream of going from imperialism back to peaceful capitalism, is it not possible to give those essentially petty bourgeois dreams the appearance of innocent con contemplations regarding peaceful ultra-imperialism? If the name of ultra-imperialism is given to an international unification of national, or more correctly, state-bound imperialisms, which would be able to eliminate the most unpleasant, the most disturbing and distasteful conflicts such as wars, political convulsions, etc., which the petty bourgeois is so much afraid of, then why not turn away from the present epoch of imperialism that has already arrived, the epoch that stares one in the face that is full of all sorts of conflicts and catastrophes? Why not turn to innocent dreams of comparatively peaceful, comparatively conflictless, comparatively non-catastrophic ultra-imperialism? And why not wave aside the exacting tasks that have been posed by the epoch of imperialism now ruling in Europe? Why not turn instead of dreaming that, that this epoch will perhaps soon be over, that perhaps it will be followed by a comparatively peaceful epoch of ultra-imperialism which demands no such sharp tactics? Kotsky says directly that at any rate such a new 
that at any rate, such a new ultra-imperialist phase of capitalism is thinkable. Whether, however, it can be realized, to answer this question, we have not yet sufficient data. In this tendency to evade the imperialism that is here and to pass in dreams to an epoch of ultra-imperialism, of which do we not do we of which we do not even know whether it is realizable, there is not a grain of Marxism. In this reasoning, Marxism is admitted for that new phase of capitalism, the realizability of which its inventor himself fails to vouch for. Whereas for the present, the existing phase of capitalism, he offers us not Marxism, but a petty bourgeois and deeply reactionary tendency to soften contradictions. There was a time when Kotsky promised to be a Marxist, Marxist in the coming restless and catastrophic epoch, which he was compelled to foresee and definitely recognize when writing his work in 1909 about the coming war. Now, when it has become absolutely clear that that epoch has arrived, Kotsky again only promises to be a Marxist in the coming epoch of ultra-imperialism, of which he does not know whether it will arrive. In other words, we have any number of his promises to be a Marxist sometime in another epoch, not under present conditions, not at this moment. For tomorrow, we have Marxism on credit, Marxism as a promise, Marxism deferred. For today, we have a petty bourgeois opportunist theory and not only a theory of softening contradictions. It is something like the internationalism for export prevailing in our days among ardent, ever so ardent internationalists and Marxists who sympathize with every expression of internationalism in the enemy's camp, anywhere but not at home, not among their allies, who sympathize with democracy as it remains a promise of their allies, who sympathize the self-determination of nations but not of those that are dependent upon the nation honored by the membership of the sympathizer. In a word, this is one of the thousand and one varieties of, of hypocrisy prevailing in our times. Can one, however, deny that in the abstract, a new phase of capitalism to follow imperialism, namely a phase of ultra-imperialism, is thinkable? No. In the abstract, one can think of such a phase. In practice, however, he who denies the sharp tasks of today in the name of dreams about soft tasks of the future becomes an, an opportunist. Theoretically, it means to fail to base oneself on the developments now going on in real life, to detach oneself from them in the name of dreams. There is no doubt that the development is going in the direction of a single world trust that will swallow up all enterprises in all states without exception. But the development in this direction is proceeding under such stress, with such a tempo, with such contradictions, conflicts, and convulsions, not only economical, but also political, national, etc., etc., that before a single world trust will be reached, before the respective national finance capitals will have formed a world union of ultra-imperialism, imperialism will inevitably explode. Capitalism will turn into its opposite. <clears throat> this is the preface. The essay to which we here call the attention of the reader represents an analysis an elaboration of an article published abroad in the Almanac Communist. <clears throat> in due time, about two years ago, the manuscript was shipped from abroad to Russia. First, it was subjected to a raid by the military censor, then it was mistakenly transmitted to the wrong publisher. After the revolution of February uh, 1917, the manuscript was found. It was supposed to see the light of day in July. But the intelligence men and the cadets who raided our party printing plant also took care of my manuscript. Much later, it was rescued in a mutilated form, a large and highly valuable introduction by Comrade Lenin, to whom I here pay the debt of deep gratitude, was missing. Due to the fact that the composition of this work dates back two years, the statistical figures are naturally antiquated, especially those relating to the effects of the war. Unfortunately, I have had no occasion as yet to revise the manuscript and to furnish it with fresh statistical material. I have only rewritten the missing pages and added the last chapter, which could not have appeared under the censor's rule. The manuscript was written at a time when socialism 
crucified by capital and the socialist traitors, was suffering the greatest possible humiliations. Soon after he had sent it to Russia, the author had ample time to ponder over revolutionary perspectives in the Swedish king's prison. This preface is written at a moment when, re when revolutionary socialism has achieved its greatest victory in Russia. It is the most ardent wish of the author that this book should soon be transformed from a weapon against imperialism into a historical or a historic document related to the archives.